Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. It's Vicky Eid from the People's Food and Farming Alliance here. Welcome to this very exciting event looking at the impact of glyphosate on the soil microbi microbiome, our gut health and our ecosystem. As you know, here at the PFFA, we aim to educate, empower and build community. And tonight is definitely one of the occasions where we're hoping to educate you um, and then to empower you to understand how you can actually move forward and do and take action. So we're thrilled to have you join us for an enlightening and transformative experience. And today we have the honor of hosting a panel of remarkable experts whose work has significantly contributed to our understanding on these critical issues. Tonight, we've got John Metcalf, who is our permaculture expert and a PFFA ambassador, and he supports our members in our Grow Your Own membership. So many of you will already know him. We've also got to got Dr. Sean Talbot, um, who is a psycho nutritionist who integrates nutrition, biochemistry and psychology to help people feel OK, look and perform better. And tonight he's going to be speaking on the effect glyphosate has on our gut microbiome. I literally can't wait to hear all about that. We're also privileged to welcome Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who is a distinguished scientist whose groundbreaking research has shed light on the pervasive effects of glyphosate on our health and the environment. Dr. Seneff's work highlights the urgent need to reevaluate our use of this chemical and its far reaching consequences on biodiversity, soil health and human wellness. And as we navigate through tonight's discussion, we encourage you to keep an open mind and engage deeply with the information presented because some of it might be a little bit different to what you're used to. Um, we're not just here to raise awareness, but we want to encourage, uh, empower you to make informed observations and decisions that can contribute to a healthier future for us all. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to John Metcalf. So handing over to you, John, you're going to get us started tonight. And John's going to be, with his permaculture background, he's going to be talking to us all about the soil. So over to you, John. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's an honour to be here um, among you know, these other experts, and I'm really looking forward to what they've got to say. We've got a packed house tonight, so I will make it as concise as I possibly can. So I'm going to share my screen, as I usually do. And I've got a little presentation for you guys. Bear with me while my... I've literally just moved into my new house, so um, it's That's all a bit great. of a mess at the moment. We can see that. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. John. So, brilliant. Thank you, Vicky. So, regenerative growing practices, a holistic solution to glyphosate. Um, so, many of you may know how dangerous and toxic glyphosate is, um, and it might seem a bit doom and gloomy. But I've got to give you some good news. Nature is amazing. It can remediate absolutely anything. And glyphosate is one of these things that we can actually heal um, with the soil, with microbes, and with a bit of creativity from us. And we've also got to have a lot of trust and faith in the process. So I'm going to give you some facts. Glyphosate inhibits the growth patterns, natural in immunological function and overall health of the soil and plants. It prevents amino acid production in plants, which is the building blocks of life. Farmers who use glyphosate also have to use fertilizers as glyphosate prevents nutrient cycling. Glyphosate negatively affects all living organisms in the soil and the ecosystem. The excess runoff permeates into groundwater, into our waterways, affecting all aquatic life. Eventually, it goes down into the, the sea as well and causes things, uh, acidifies the oceans. Uh, so glyphosate in the form of Roundup is used by millions of people around the world as a weed killer. 
you might know someone who's used it. Um, it gets sold in all supermarkets. So it's everywhere. Um, big ag funding prevents mainstream research and investigation into the effects of these products on plant health and soil health. Farmers around the world are held to ransom by the use of glyphosate as they don't have access to an alternative until now. So the more, the, the more that farmers rely on subsidies by the UK government and chemical ag, and the more they are priced out by supermarkets, the less empowered they can be to seek an alternative. So it's up to us. Farmers also need to see evidence of regenerative farming practices before they will invest in an alternative. So what is the alternative? How can farmers make the transition? How can we heal the land? <laughs> As with everything in life, we only need to look to nature for the solutions. She will give us deep insight, inspiration and wisdom. So what is regenerative growing or agriculture? So it mimics nature. It partners with nature. It is in rhythm with the cycles of nature. It is about giving as well as receiving. It is focused on healing the soil and ourselves. It's about rebuilding the soil microbiome. It's about putting people before profit. It's what our ancestors used to practice hundreds of years ago. It's a slow process, so patience and trust are essential. Nature is slow, but we can help rebalance her. So this regeneration comes in a few different uh, stages. We have remediation, restoration, and regeneration, but they all begin with re-mindsetting. So what are some of the solutions that farmers and growers alike can use to heal their soils? And what are the practices they can use to maintain their yields and increase profits without glyphosate, other pesticides and fertilizers. So let's start with remediation. Microbes are the key to remediating the soils. Mushrooms such as pearl oyster and turkey tail are able to decompose glyphosate. Aggressive strains of bacteria such as Acromobacter can degrade glyphosate in weeks, which is amazing. Uh, as more independent research and testing is done, there seems to be a number of microbiological organisms that can remediate soil and plants from glyphosate. These microbes extract, degrade, filtrate, volatilize and stabilize toxins and chemicals such as glyphosate. The health of the soil biome is directly related to the health of our gut biome. The soil is like the stomach for the plants. If we can heal these together, it will even transform the way we feel, think and act. And I'm sure Sean can tell you more about that. Uh, so the next stage is restoration. So we not only need to remediate the glyphosate from the land, we also need to re reintroduce the bacteria, fungi, nutrients and energy. We can look to and replicate natural ecosystems and mimic them to create healthy, abundant, resilient and biodiverse growing spaces. To restore the soils that have been degraded for nearly a century now, we need to think and act holistically. The soil, just like our bodies, is a living ecosystem. So we need to bring back the natural biology, chemistry and electrical energy. So this can be done by restoring the soil structure, restoring the microbiology, return to polyculture growing systems, creating biodiversity and nutrient availability, increasing the soil organic matter, which will increase energy, reintroduce mycelium networks. These are crucial to plant health. So once we remediate and restore the soils, we can start using techniques and methods to redesign how the agricultural systems operate. Regeneration. 
we can use practices like permaculture, biodynamics, and natural farming in collaboration to heal, redesign, and create new ways of thinking and doing. Frameworks, methodologies, age-old wisdom from around the world that are all based upon connection and respect to nature and realizing we are an integral and fundamental part of it. Remindsetting, and this is where I, I believe we really need to begin. So our farms used to be the center of the community. Now many farmers are overworked, underpaid, and have no one to pass on their legacy onto. So what can we do to bring the farm back to the community? As consumers and citizens, we can reach out to farmers, show our support and get involved in creating the community around the farm, gradually helping them to transition to regenerative practices. There are farmers out there that will give, loan or sell their land to you. And I know people who have actually done this. We can show farmers that it actually works. My teacher of permaculture and soil improved his soil so much in a very dry and hot area in America, the local farmers started to notice and some of them actually became his students. We can start where we are and spread out into the community. The likelihood is that Roundup is probably being used near you. But in the UK, there's over 2.5 million acres of gardens and allotments. So there's a big opportunity to be able to create change. All of this is possible when we partner with nature. We have an incredible opportunity here to transform our soil, animal and human health, society and create a new paradigm. The power lay in your hands. So that's kind of it for my presentation. I'm not sure if I've hit those 20 minutes, but um, yeah, I'd just like to say that this is, you know, this is a real, we were talking before you guys got on and this needs to, we can't just do this through one way. We need to have, have a multi-pronged attack. And really this is about solutions focused. So rather than looking at all the problems and getting overwhelmed and feeling the fear, which I felt and I still do feel, if we just look to nature and we look to people around the world that are actually doing this and proving this, this can actually work, we only need to, uh, you know, kind of reach out to our community, start forming these connections because if you're trying to, and I've done this before as well, if you're trying to tell people to stop doing something, they probably won't stop doing it. But if you show them an alternative, they're far more likely to want to kind of jump on board. And our whole way of life is so full of toxins. Glyphosate is obviously a big one, but it's just one of them. But in my mind, if we can create alternatives, people are going to look at it and think that's a much healthier way to be. It's a much more healthier way to grow food or to, um, to be able to actually communicate with people, you know? So this is, this is really essential. So I'm here to kind of ask, answer questions at the end of it. I'm here to support people. Um, and I want to be part of it. And I really hope that you can too. So thank you very much for listening. I know it's been a little bit short, uh, but I'll hand it back to Vicky. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thanks, John. That was really interesting. And you know, I didn't know 2.5 million acres of garden and allotments. That's a lot. Amazing, of isn't it? That's a, really amazing. Um, yeah. And But you're right that so many gardeners and allotment holders, I see it in my gardening groups, that they all use it and they're like don't worry it's out of the earth within a month or so mm. and they just you know they just believe this kind of thing but you filled us with lots of hope there and like you say it's just having lots of different alternatives and knowing what to do 
that then empowers us to enable us to do it. And, and the other thing is, it's only been the last hundred years that we've been growing with these toxic chemicals. I mean, we've been growing for thousands, if not millions of years, using just our hands, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, and I know that since I've been doing this, since I've been eating food that I've grown, my health has just improved and improved. And as Sean will probably, my mental state has improved, Yeah, you know? So we've got such a great opportunity and I really believe we can transform everything, you know? So thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, that was really great. And now I'm going to hand over to Patricia, um, who will then introduce our next guest. Patricia, you will need to turn your camera on, my lovely. It's not letting me, so I click video. Oh, oh now, me... okay, you need to do... allow me. Now, let's see. There we are. There we are. Well, I am uh, so excited once again to introduce Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who is joining us all the way from Hawaii. So it's early in the morning for her. And actually, this is our third time to have Dr. Seneff speak on our Global Glyphosate Summit. If you've joined us before, you will have heard Dr. Seneff revealing the depth of glyphosate's impact on our genes, specifically our glycine molecule, which is very eye-opening. The depth of knowledge based on her own research is absolutely second to none. She is regarded by her peers and many others as the world's foremost authority on glyphosate. Dr. Seneff is an MIT professor and author of Toxic Legacy. I highly recommend this. Uh, you can find many of uh, Dr. Seneff's talks and interviews on YouTube and other platforms, which I highly recommend. And thanks to Dr. Seneff, we don't have to be the experts. We just connect people to the experts. And I am thrilled to turn over to Dr. Seneff now to share with us how glyphosate is impacting our ecosystem. Over to you, Dr. Seneff. Lovely introduction. Uh, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Sorry, I think I was muted there. <laughs> um, so I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. And uh, my topic today is actually uh, different from what I usually talk about with glyphosate, as you know. So I'm focusing on the ecosystem. Uh, as uh, I've done many, many um, talks and papers around glyphosate's toxicity to humans and all the different health effects that it has, which are legion. I mean, as you said, glycine, it substitutes for glycine during protein synthesis. I believe that's true, even though I'm getting some pushback from the uh, industry. But um, I think I should just go right to my slides. I have a set of slides that I've prepared. And so I will share my screen. OK, you all can see this. Yes, we can. Yes, we can, Stephanie. Great. OK, so here's my title, Glyphosate and the Ecosystem. I always like to start my talks off with a quote. If you think the economy is more important than the environment, try holding your breath while counting your money. And I just <laughs> kind of like that quote. So here's where we're going. Uh, I have an introduction, and then I'm going to talk about red tide in Florida and, and the algae bloom issues, um, both in Florida and, of course, around the Great Lakes. There's a lot of issues with algae blooms that I think are being glyphosate's a major contributor to that. I'm going to speak about how glyphosate disrupts both nitrogen and carbon fixation, and that actually connects a lot to the issues with high levels of greenhouse gases. And then finally, cloud seeding. This is something that I newly discovered within the last couple of months. Very fascinating science around these phytoplankton that are able to create clouds over the ocean, over the shallow seas, and they're being uh, killed by glyphosate. So I have a feeling that's affecting uh, the cloud cover over the oceans, which is causing the oceans to heat up. So first, an introduction, a brief history of glyphosate. It's now the number one herbicide in use, both in the US and throughout the world. Um, it was patented by Monsanto um, as an, an herbicide in 1969. So it's been around for a very long time. Uh, we started getting poisoned by it in 1974. They started using it to control weeds in the environment. It came out from under patent in 2000. It inhibits an enzyme in the chicken mate pathway involved in the synthesis of tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine, which are the three aromatic amino acids. And there was a huge expansion of GMO, corn, soy, cotton, and canola crops in the late 1990s, which has led to sharp increases in the use of glyphosate over the past two years, and that two, uh, two decades. 
And that really has a lot to do with the increased resistance of the weeds. As they used glyphosate on these GMO crops, many of the weeds evolved to be resistant, so they had to use more. And that's why it kept the uh, usage here kept going up over time as the as the weeds became resistant. And now we're kind of in a crisis where glyphosate is simply not working on certain very resistant weeds. And they're having to introduce other chemicals besides glyphosate into the formulations to control, to control those resistant weeds. Um, this is my book. You saw her uh, holding it up, uh, released by Chelsea Green in 2021. And it has a huge uh, list of references in the back, uh, hundreds or yeah, hundreds of references in the back. It presents extensive data on glyphosate toxicity to both animals and humans. And it shows how glyphosate interferes with sulfate homeostasis. And I think that is a critical factor in autism. And I believe glyphosate is the number one cause of the autism epidemic that we're seeing in the United States today. And the book argues that glyphosate is insidiously cumulatively toxic through its diabolical insertion into proteins by mistake in place of the coding amino acid glycine. This is a central theme of the book and also a central theme of my presentations on glyphosate. We'll get to that more here in a moment. This unique feature explains why it is causal in so many diseases. And the book was selected by Kirkus Reviews as one of the top 100 nonfiction books of 2021. So here's the big picture. Glyphosate disrupts many aspects of metabolism in plants, animals, microbes, and fungi. Uh, increased use of fertilizers compensates for inefficient utilization of nitrogen and phosphorus. And then you have nitrate and phosphate runoff into the waterways, which then introduces, um, and it causes a lot of disruption of the, micro, uh, of the ecosystem in the waterways. Nitrous oxide, which comes from the nitrate uh, spill off, is a potent greenhouse gas, much more potent than carbon dioxide, and it's induced by glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate interferes with the capture of carbon in the plants and then in the soil. And certain marine phytoplankton can seed cloud formation over oceans, but glyphosate suppresses their growth. And I think that may be a critical issue in the warming of the oceans, which is messing up the coral reefs. So this was a lovely uh, paper. I was quite struck by this paper showing that glyphosate accumulates in biofilms. Um, so glyphosate um, polluting waterways, glyphosate is polluting the waterways, for example, in Florida. And so what they did in this experiment was they, they added, uh, they had some water that was murky, had a lot of biomass in it, and they added glyphosate to it. And then they measured how much glyphosate was in the water after a period of time. And what they found was the glyphosate disappeared rapidly. And then it was like, where did it go? It wasn't that it got metabolized by the microbes, it was that it got sucked up by the biofilms. So the biofilms actually had two to four orders of magnitude higher levels of glyphosate than the surrounding water. And I think this is what's impacted the manatees uh, in Florida making them sick because they're eating that biomass and so they're getting a huge concentration of glyphosate in their diet. So it appears to rapidly disappear but that's an illusion. And then there are all these important uh, bottom of the food chain animals that live in those biofilms that are also getting heavily exposed to the glyphosate. So the, a quote from that paper, we may be under recognizing the potential ecological risk of contaminants like glyphosate that are bios concentrating in biofilms and subsequently being consumed and going up the food chain. So water fleas are a, a very uh, low level animal in the food chain. So they're very important too, because animals eat those and animals eat the animals that eat those, et cetera. They're near the bottom of the aquatic food chain. All these other animals, tadpoles, salamanders, newts, aquatic insects, and many types of small fish feed on the water fleas. So they did an experiment exposing water fleas to low dose concentrations of Roundup and glyphosate, well below the approved regulatory threshold. And then they looked at their health and they found many problems, embryonic developmental failure, systemic inflammation, uh, de degradation of the collagen matrix, impaired wound he healing, disrupted gut microbes. And so the animals that eat the water fleas pick up the glyphosate and then they get sick and it goes up the food chain. So here's a, uh, my next section, red tide and algae blooms. Uh, so this was an article, is agriculture's use of glyphosate feeding Lake O's uh, explosive algae blooms? That's Lake Okeechobee in Florida where there's sugarcane agriculture all around the lake. And then a glyphosate is also used in the waterways. They have some invasive weeds in the waterways and they actually put water glyphosate into the water. There's also, of course, the lovely homes in Florida that use glyphosate on their, on their beautiful lawns. And that's also washing off into the waterways. So the waterways in Florida have high levels of glyphosate in them. And these uh, microbes, cyanobacteria, can break down the CP bond in glyphosate. Glyphosate has this rather unique CP bond that stumps most animal species, including microbes. But these cyanobacteria are very good at breaking that bond. They can utilize the phosphorus that's released as a food, as a nutrition nutrient for them, and then they can ex explosively grow. The cyanobacteria go out of control because they're actually doing a good service, which is to break down the glyphosate. And so. Um, 
chronic exposure to glyphosate in Florida manatee uh, article here uh, published in 2021. Uh, manatees are getting very sick every year. They're getting worse this year. It's even worse than last year. Um, their populations are being decimated uh, and they look like they're kind of dying of starvation. So glyphosate is ubiquitous in the waterways in Florida. And then of course the sugarcane harvest was introducing higher concentrations. They observed that in this study. Um, those manatees um, have increased have increased body burdens since 2009. Their body burdens are going up every year since 2009 when they measure the, the, the level of glyphosate in the manatees. And then they're sick and starving due to the loss of seagrass and the seagrass is where the glyphosate is being sucked up because of that issue of the biomass. Uh, so the cyanobacteria feed the red tide. So we have a huge problem with the red tide around the Florida um, coastal areas. Um, and also, and so also the inland blue-green algae um, around uh, Great Lakes, for example. Uh, well, this is South Florida. This is talking specifically about South Florida during the summer, killing vast numbers of fish and other wildlife, including dozens of dolphins, manatees, sea turtles, sharks, and eels. Um, so the cyanobacteria actually feed off of the glyphosate. They, they love it because it's got both phosphorus and nitrogen. It's everything they need to grow. And then, um, and then the red tide algae flourish because the cyanobacteria are able to supply them with a nitrate um, that they need to flourish. And so this is a whole food chain that works well because the glyphosate is fueling the growth of the cyanobacteria and that causes the red tide, which uh, makes the seafood inedible. So uh, Zen Hanukkah is a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine. She's a founder of Moms Across America and Moms Across America did a study on, um, on lots of things, including the Florida orange juice. Uh, which is uh, it, which she found lots of glyphosate in Florida orange juice, which of course is also being exposed to the glyphosate that's being heavily used uh, in Florida for all the reasons that I've discussed. So she took a water sample from the from the coast of Cape Coral, Coral at the mouth of the Kalusahatchee River, and uh, there were cyanobacteria growing there. And then she uh, level she measured the uh, glyphosate levels and got back this result. Your level is that what she found in her sample. This is a sample from Sacramento Municipal Drinking Water, so they had contamination, but much, much less. This is the maximum amount allowed by Europe. So even this sample exceeded the maximum, and this one far, far exceeded the maximum amount of glyphosate allowed in Europe, in water in Europe. Okay, next topic, disrupted nitrogen and carbon fixation. Agricultural runoff contributes to climate change, um, was an article that was published here. Um, uh, news.nsf, news. <laughs> news. from the NSF. Um, so nitrous oxide is a potent greenhouse gas. Its warming potential is 300 times that of carbon dioxide. So we talk a lot about carbon dioxide, but we really should be looking at nitrous oxide. And then the fertilizer runoff in the farm fields increases the load of nitrogen washing into the rivers and streams. And there the nitrogen breathing, breathing back microbes can break down the fertilites into nit nitrous oxide. And that's released into the atmosphere. That's a gas. And so what happens is that the nitrates that come down get reduced to nitrous oxide, get released as a gas, and contribute a major, in a major way to a global warming. Um, so how glyphosate can disrupt nitrogen fixation in plants, I have three references here. Um, among beans, a study among beans exposed to glyphosate showed that they had impaired nitrogen uptake. So glyphosate is messing up the uptake of nitrogen into plants. And that's critically dependent on nitrogen fixing bacteria. And they use an enzyme called nitrogenase to convert nitrogen to ammonia, which makes it accessible to the plants. Uh, so glyphosate exposure at sublethal levels severely impairs nitrogenase activity in these microbes. And it also inhibits phosphoenolpyruvate carboxylase. This is a very important in enzyme in plants. And I'll have more to say about it in a moment, but that is also important for the incorporation of both carbon and nitrogen into plants. So for all of these reasons, you can expect more nitrous oxide being released from the waterways because of the runoff from the crops because the crops aren't taking it up. So PEPEC is a very interesting enzyme. It's a ubiquitous enzyme in plants. It's also present in archaea, cyanobacteria, and green algae. And it's an integral enzyme in, the photosynthesis, in photosynthesis to assimilate carbon dioxide into green plants. So that's super important. It's an important enzyme for photosynthesis. So it has a terminal sequence. This is getting into some, some technical details. QNTG, this G is glycine. So these are amino acids, a sequence of four amino acids. The last amino acid in, its, in that molecule is glycine. And it's highly conserved across multiple phyla. So all these different species of, uh, of, of animals in the animal kingdom have, um, and in the microbes have uh, glycine at the end of that. I'm sorry, not in the animal kingdom, plant kingdom and microbes have that G at the end. Um, glyphosate was shown experimentally to suppress the activity of this in a study here, which was published in 2006. 
and replacement of terminal glycine with the negatively charged amino acid aspartate causes up to a thousand fold decrease in its act activity. And this is super important because I always use aspartate and glutamate as a model for glyphosate. And I talk about that in my book because those two are very similar to, um, to glyphosate in their physical and chemical properties because they're bulkier, much bulkier than glycine and they have a negative charge just like uh, glyphosate. So they're a good model. So if you, I know if our aspartate is substituting, then when glyphosate substitutes, you'll have the same effect, a thousand fold decrease. So this is just a, a, a paper that shows all these different species here of, uh, uh, of um, microbes and whatnot that have uh, this different versions of this enzyme. And they all have this glycine at the end. It's absolutely conserved among all these different species. So uh, glyphosate excessive use chronically disrupts the chicken mate pathway and can affect phytophotosynthesis and yield in citrus trees. And actually Don Huber has talked a lot about the citrus trees in Florida suffering from a disease called citrus greening. And he has actually done studies with uh, farmers who, who changed to organic farming and found that citrus, citrus greening disappeared. So I think glyphosate is a major factor in that problem that they're facing in the Florida oranges. And this paper is quite technical and it goes into a lot of detail about the different effects, all of which are bad, um, that, the, um, that shows that the plants are unable to uh, trap carbon and they don't grow as well. They don't have bear as much fruit, they have a low yield um, and carbon dioxide assimilation goes down, which means that you're gonna have more carbon dioxide in the air, your fruit yields goes down. Chicken mate accumulates in the plants. And, um, and, and so they showed, this is the blue is where they, um, the red is where they applied the glyphosate and then the glyphosate distributed throughout the plant into the, into the other leaves. And that's where it shows the blue, blue translocated into the leaves. Um, so here's a study on the effects of glyphosate on glyphosate sensitive and glyphosate resistant soybean plants. It's a really nice study. They looked at two different kinds of soybean, those that had the GMO that protected them, made the shikimate pathway per perform correctly and those that didn't. And both, both types of plants were affected, but in different ways. And so the sensitive plants, um, rapidly in, in rapid inhibition of leaf photosynthesis, very, very important, because again, that's going to be trapping carbon. And glyphosate produced a rapid marked and sustained inhibition of photosynthetic carbon dioxide assimilation in the glyphosate sensitive line. It's a quote from the paper. And then also it marked increase in glutathione synthesis. So they, uh, it's an antioxidant defense. Glutathione is very important in both animals and plants as an antioxidant. And glyphosate induces an oxidative stress. That's been shown in many papers that I've read. And so they have to increase the amount of glutathione in order to um, compensate, to try to soak up those active oxygen species. Uh, the resistant plants uh, actually had a significantly reduced amount of chlorophyll compared to controls. And so that's also, they're also being affected by an inability to uh, perform um, uh, photosynthesis. Um, and then they had accumulated high levels of glyphosate, very high levels of glyphosate in their leaves. And so any plant that's got leaves that you eat, then that's the glyphosate is gonna go into those leaves and we're gonna be exposed. Increased pools of oxida oxidized glutathione and ascorbate, both of which are antioxidant defensive. And then a very important point, Rubisco expression was reduced by a factor of 25. I was very shocked when I saw that because Rubisco is the most common enzyme on the planet and it plays an essential role in photosynthesis. So this is really gonna be a hit hard on photosynthesis because of the reduction in the activity of Rubisco. And Rubisco is, a, is one of those proteins that has what I call a glyphosate susceptibility motif. So I would predict that Rubisco would be uh, affected by glyphosate. And now cloud seeding and marine phytoplankton. This is my last section. Um, DMS, the climate gas you've never heard of, dimethyl sulfide is a small sulfur containing gas that plays a significant role in climate change. And as I said, this is something that I only learned recently. Uh, it's a fascinating molecule, dimethyl sulfide. Here's a picture of it. This is the sulfur. And then there's these two methyl groups attached to it. And uh, you know about methylation pathways. So I suspect that it may be supplying uh, both methyl groups and sulfur um, as, a, as a resource uh, for microbes in the clouds, I'm suspecting. So it decreases the amount of solar radiation that reaches the Earth's surface by inducing cloud formation. So it makes clouds over the, over the shallow seas. And it synthesized from another molecule, which is a mouthful, dimethyl sulfonyopropionate, DMSP, by marine phytoplankton in shallow ocean waters. And there's a, a, a microbe in particular, Emiliania huxleyi, E. huxleyi, which is an important marine, phyto, marine phytoplankton species that synthesizes this precursor. So it's gonna be able to make that dimethyl sulfide. 
And so this particular species, I found an article that talks about glyphosate's effects on this species. And as I said, it produces this DMSP and it exhibited severe growth inhibition when it was exposed to glyphosate. And they did it at two different levels, a low level 36 micromolar and a higher level 360 micromolar. And this is the plot that they got from their results. Uh, the white is the control. This is the lower level of glyphosate. And, uh, this is, and this is the higher level of glyphosate. So it completely kills uh, these species at higher levels. And it also suppresses them at the lower levels of glyphosate. Um, and so the suppression of the release of DMS from phytoplankton in shallow seas may have a significant impact on climate change through insufficient cloud formation over the oceans. So in summary, glyphosate is pervasive in our environment and it is a significant contributor to human health issues and harm to the ecosystem. Glyphosate accumulates in biomass and harms water fleas um, at the bottom of the food chain. It, uh, chemical based agriculture in Florida is leading to the toxic algae blooms and harm to the Florida manatees and other species. Glyphosate disturbs the nutrients in the soil, chelating minerals and interfering with nitrogen uptake and photosynthesis. Marine phytoplankton can see clouds, but glyphosate interferes with it, that process. And we urgently need to drastically reduce the use of glyphosate on crops. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Seneff. I've got about a million questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I will save them till the end when uh, Dr. Talbot finishes his talk, and I'm sure others will have questions as well. So I hope you can hang around for a few minutes. Thank you so much. Well, now it is my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Sean Talbot, who I met about sort of about 12 years ago, um, shortly after my doctor told me there was nothing more he could do to help me. Well, fortunately, I heard Sean give a talk and he spoke a very different language from my doctor. Uh, he spoke a language of how my body worked and subsequently turned my life around. So I hitched my wagon to his star all that time ago. Sean is a psychonutritionist who integrates nutrition biochemistry and psychology. I'll say that one more time. He integrates nutrition, biochemistry, and psychology to help people feel, look, and perform better. John was one of the early pioneers of the gut brain access movement, educating us about our second brain. He has been an extraordinary product developer for decades who not only walks the talk, but he runs, cycles, swims, climbs as well. <laughs> He's competed in the Ironman competition for years and achieved fittest CEO of the year several times, competes in triathlons, and runs several wellness centers around the world and speaks publicly addressing root cause issues linked to our state of unwellness. As a scientist with a PhD in nutritional biochemistry from Rutgers and an entrepreneur with a degree in EMP and entrepreneurship from MIT, uh, his name may be familiar to you if you have read his first book, followed by these two, which uh, were page turners for me because it's like, this is my life playing out. Uh, his 14th book, How He Has Time to Write, I don't know, but this is a must read. Vicky's had it. We were delighted when we realized we both had the same book. And uh, Sean will give us, we'll have a few links at the end of his talk, and uh, then we'll have some, some Q&A. So um, over to you, Sean. All right. Thank you, Patricia, for that for that wonderful introduction. And th thank you for thank you to you and and Vicky for uh, for inviting me. Uh, maybe when you come back on the camera, we can we can talk about what your T-shirt says. Uh, but it says happy is the new sexy. I wore this T-shirt today because because of what we're talking about, healthy gut, healthy mind. Because I'm going to talk about the link between the microbiome and the gut and how glyphosate can mess that up um, and how the gut really is the second brain that determines in large part how we feel here in our first brain, you know, so much so that we say often in the kind of work that I do that how you feel is not just in your head, it's also in your gut because your gut is your second brain. It's the source of all your neurotransmitters. And I want to try to unpack that for everybody. So let me get my slides up and let me see. We're right here. And we're gonna share this. And oh geez, that didn't that didn't come out the way I wanted it to. There we go. It's over here now. All right, so let me do this. All right, beautiful. So you should be able to see that now, hopefully. Um, 
let me do let me do one thing real quick. I want to make sure that I that I'm doing this the right way. Um, I'm gonna stop this. I want to make sure that I'm sharing my correct screen for everybody. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna redo this now. Um, bear with me real quick. That one. Okay, beautiful. So now we should be in good shape. So. Um, uh, as Patricia said in the introduction, my, my PhD is in nutritional biochemistry, but the kind of work that I do and have done for the last 20 or so years sometimes is called nutritional psychology these days, right? It's this, it's this idea of the link between what we eat and how that affects our gut, but then how our gut affects our brain and our mental wellness and our overall mood state. And you know, when I started doing it 20 or so years ago, um, it really was something that didn't make sense to a lot of people. You know, how in the world can my gut influence what's happening in my brain? And nowadays, if we sort of find ourselves in the the right place at the right time, if you will, where so many people are talking about mental wellness, so many people are talking about stress levels and depression levels and anxiety levels and all those sorts of things. And finally realizing that the science around the microbiome is really changing to the point where we can not only understand the science, right? And, and you know, it's interesting because of that, but we can actually go in and we can manipulate and modulate the microbiome to improve how we feel on a on a on a variety of different levels. Um, so I let me let me start off. You know, I'm, uh, Patricia was very kind kind to show several of my books. There's lots of other really good authors, and I recommend their books too. So this is what I'm going to be talking about for about the next 20 minutes. This mind gut connection, the gut immune connection. Both of these books by a, by a good friend of mine, Emron Meyer at UCLA. This book, The Psychobiotic Revolution. I'll talk a little bit about probiotics and prebiotics and things like that, that we can recommend to help to kind of repair the gut or nourish the gut to get better signals coming out of the gut so that we feel better. These are sometimes called psychobiotics now because they are biotics, they're bacteria or, or, or fiber structures that can change the gut, but they have a psychological effect, right? That's, the, that's that idea of psychonutrition um, that, we're, that we're really trying to pioneer. Um, here are a couple of other uh, books, Brain Changer. This is all about the Mediterranean diet and other ways of eating to change mood. This is your brain on food. Uh, uh, Uma Nadu at at Harvard um, has has written a really nice book here. Here's my mental fitness book that just came out a couple of years ago. Um, it, it it's this idea that your mental wellness can be traced back biochemically right down to the level of your microbiome right to the level of the bacteria in your gut and i won't i won't spend too too much time on this but just to say that the majority of our neurotransmitters are made in our gut and glyphosate can interfere with the production of those neurotransmitters i'll talk a little bit about that biochemistry in just a second but when we when we talk about those neurotransmitters we're talking about serotonin. 90% of your serotonin, which is sort of the neurotransmitter of happiness, um, is, is made in your gut. And so if your gut is not right and you're not making enough serotonin, you're very likely to be not as happy as you want to be. You might be sad. You might be you might be depressed. Similarly, 70% of our dopamine, the neurotransmitter of motivation, is made in the gut. About 50% of our GABA, GABA is the is the body's primary relaxing neurotransmitter. So if we can't make enough GABA, we're going to be tense and irritable and anxious. If we can't make enough GABA, we probably have trouble falling asleep at night. There's all kinds of sleep problems out there in the world, but falling asleep, you know, being able to wind down enough and calm your and relax your brain, that is a GABA thing. It's not related to melatonin, but you can see melatonin is here. About 80% of our melatonin is made in the gut. So we can go through all of these different signaling molecules. Um, and, and the sort of moral of this story, if you will, is that your microbiome and your gut in general is sort of like an internal on-demand dynamic natural pharmacy. So meaning if it's in balance, it will produce what you need, when you need it, in the right amounts in terms of your neurotransmitters for your mood, your cytokines, which are which are inflammatory signals, um, your immune, a lot of your immune system actually resides in, in the gut. We, we usually say around 70 to 80% of your immune system is in the gut. And so you, you, you guys are sort of 
probably uh, seeing where I'm going with this. If your gut is out of balance, there will be a lot of imbalances across your entire body. You'll have mental imbalances. You'll have immune system imbalances. You'll have inflammatory imbalances. And that might be that because glyphosate interferes with what is happening at the level of your microbiome, and thus you get this domino effect of interfering with metabolism throughout the entire rest of the body. Okay, so that's the that's the sort of premise. Um, I do a lot of research. I write a lot of books. I'm talking to you right now from from this facility. This is uh, this is our our, our mental wellness center uh, in Plymouth, Massachusetts, just south of Boston. Um, we do a certification program at Marietta College, where I got my sports medicine degree, where we train people to be certified mental wellness coaches. And what we try to do is be as holistic as possible. We train people about the microbiome. We train people about the gut brain axis. We educate educate about how to eat and how to expose yourself to nature and how to move your body and how to get good sleep quality right so it's not just it's not just one thing that we can do it's a multitude of things that we can do which i think gives us gives us a little bit of hope when we hear some of the dismal statistics when you start hearing about how you know our soil is being damaged like john was talking about and how our environment is being damaged like you heard stephanie talk about right that can be kind of gloomy to, to to understand but there is a lot that we can do to kind of kind of fight back against some of this stuff so one of the programs that i've been writing about since since my very very first book the cortisol connection is what you see on the screen right here the sense program s-e-n-s-e -S -S -E. and i do talk a lot about supplements I talk about different probiotic strains and different prebiotic fibers and different phytonutrients etc because I view those for a lot of people as almost being like the easy button, right? Where, you know, everybody knows they're supposed to exercise. Everyone knows they're supposed to eat right. Everyone knows they're supposed to get eight hours of sleep, et cetera, et cetera. And yet there's this gap between what we know sort of intellectually and what we do behaviorally that supplements sometimes can help us close that gap. To, for, for, for example, if we can help somebody with their motivation, maybe they'll exercise more. If we can help them with their appetite signals, which a lot of those come from the gut, we can help them choose a better diet. If we can help them relax, GABA, for example, like I talked about a minute ago, we can help them get better sleep quality. So I always like to put it, put supplements in the proper context because I think in the supplement world, there's a lot of like magic bullet thinking where you can just take the pill or mix up a magical powder and drink it down and it's going to solve all your problems. But it really needs to be thought of in the proper context. Um, but when we feed things to the gut, we are directly applying them to the microbiome. And I put this graphic up just to, just to show that there's a lot going on here. The gut and the brain talk to each other on a millisecond by millisecond basis. Sometimes the brain and the gut are talking to each other through the nervous system, things like the vagus nerve. Sometimes they're talking to each other through neurotransmitters, like I just talked about a few minutes ago. Sometimes these signals are being sent through your immune system. Sometimes they're being sent through your inflammatory cascade, these, these compounds called cytokines. But there's a lot of signaling that goes back and forth between these two, these two brains, so to speak. Um, you're going to be scared by this by 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 the graphic that I'm going to show you in a second, which, which which illustrates the whole signaling across the gut brain axis. But it really can be as complex, which you'll see on the next slide, or as simple as you want it to be. This is the simple idea that what happens in the gut, whatever you feed to the gut, whether this is good food or bad food, or a supplement or not a supplement, or uh, or glyphosate or not glyphosate, that's gonna change the signals that come out of the gut and go across the axis to the brain. And the axis is, um, I'm not gonna talk too much about the axis, but suffice to say that it is the communication network whereby those two brains talk to each other. So a lot of times when we're trying to modulate someone's mental wellness, there are things we can do in the brain. It's not like the brain isn't an important tissue anymore. It's still a very, very important organ. There's things we can do directly in the brain 
to help people improve how they feel. There's things we can do in the gut, the second brain, to improve how people feel. There's even things we can do in the in the axis alone, you know, it, separate from the two brains. We can we can prime the immune system. We can lower, you know, inflammatory load. We can improve blood flow. Right. Those are all signaling pathways that if we if we improve them, if we improve the efficiency of that signaling, we can improve how somebody feels overall. So uh, again, this gives us a lot of touch points, if you will, to help somebody feel better. This is the complicated uh, 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 version of it. Anytime we eat, let me orient everybody to this. I use this in all of my, you know, all of my lectures to students to show them how much signaling happens across the gut brain axis. So here's the brain at the top. This is the blood brain barrier. This is all the signaling that happens across the axis. So neurotransmitters and hormones and peptides and cytokines and bioactive signals, including, uh, you know, in, including the immune system cells. Um, this is the gut lining, which is actually very structurally similar. The gut lining is very structurally similar to the to the blood brain barrier. Um, and if one is leaky, if you have leaky gut, for example, you almost definitely have leaky brain. And then at the bottom here, you see the microbiome and you see these influential factors, the food that we eat on the good side, the green side of the of the uh, of the of the cartoon or the or the bad side, the red side. And so every time we eat, we have the opportunity to send good signals from the gut to the brain or not good signals, adverse signals. And the and the result, the, the 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 end result of all of that is that we can either be building our brains and improving them, or we can be breaking them down and leading to neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. So that that that's sort of like the lead up into actually talking about glyphosate. I wanted to sort of like level set everybody so we know how much signaling is actually coming from the microbiome and the gut brain axis um, because of things like this. This is a paper that I always use in my classes when I'm trying to educate students about how, how glyphosate has wide ranging mental and physical derangements across the entire gut brain axis. Um, so this paper came out uh, about a, about two years ago, maybe, let's see, 2023, maybe, maybe the middle part of 2020. Oh, here we go right here. Yeah, September, September 2023. Um, and I think it does a really good job of giving a, a very good overview in a somewhat technical but not overly technical way that I can give to general uh, general general science students. Um, and what you see in this paper, here's just a section of the background, which which gives us a lot of background on glyphosate. We can we can unpack this and 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 really very simply say a few things about glyphosate for for the purposes of our of our discussion right now. It has it, it's it's an herbicide, but it has antimicrobial activity, right? So it's an antibiotic. Um, it's widespread in the environment. You just heard Dr. Seneff talk about it's been shown to to be present in our waterways and in our orange juice. There's the, there's reports that show that it, it that it shows up in cereal like Cheerios and things like that. It's sprayed on the lawns at the at the park uh, and in you know people's front yards and things like that. So we are exposed to it all over the place. Uh, the WHO has uh, labeled it as a probable carcinogen. And we know that it's detrimental to the microbiome, um, which I'm which I'm going to mostly mostly focus on now. So I speak at a lot of um, natural products conferences, right? Where there'll be a lot of people who are really into regenerative ag agriculture, really into organic foods, really into natural this and natural that. And I will sometimes try to stir up the audience just to get everybody a little riled up at the beginning. And I'll come up as a, as a scientist and I'll say, you know what, all this hype about glyphosate being dangerous, I don't get it. Be, and I'm and I'm doing this for effect, okay? So nobody get nobody gets scared right now. I do it for effect because the pathway, um, and this this was in Dr. Seneff's uh, presentation, the biochemical pathway that glyphosate works on to 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 to, to kill weeds um, is not present in humans. It's only present in plants and bacteria, and it's not present in humans. And so I'll say to the crowd, I go. If this pathway isn't even present in humans, how in the world can glyphosate be bad for us? And you know, I'm, again, I'm doing it for effect. Back in the late 60s and the early 70s, when glyphosate was coming onto the market, 
we really knew next to nothing about the microbiome. And of course, if this pathway is present in bacteria, it is present in humans because bacteria are present in humans. Our microbiome is a collection of trillions, maybe as many as a hundred trillion bacteria that do a lot more than just produce neurotransmitters. They regulate our aging process. They regulate our level of inflammation. They regulate our immune system. They regulate, they really regulate everything, right? It's hard these days to study the microbiome without looking at it and going, wow, this microbiome controls absolutely every aspect of human metabolism. And so if you damage that pathway so that the microbiome here cannot produce these aromatic amino acids, if you're a plant, that's bad because now you're not going to be able to do normal metabolism and the plant can't produce its proteins and therefore it dies, right? So that's why, that's why the weeds die. But if this happens in your microbiome, you can't produce the things that that are uh, that these are building blocks for. So phenylalanine is a building block for norepinephrine. Tryptophan is a building block for serotonin and melatonin. Tyrosine is a building block for dopamine. So follow me here for just a second. We've been seeing over the last 10, 20 years, we've been seeing an explosion around the world in mental wellness problems, more depression, more anxiety, more burnout, more PTSD, more ADHD, more autism, which all you can trace all the way back on neurotransmitter metabolism pathways, all the way back to the microbiome. And this, I think, is the problem. I think that we're seeing damage of glyphosate at the level of the microbiome. So the microbiome is less efficient or, or very inefficient in producing these aromatic amino acids. And therefore, we can't produce those neurotransmitters. And that's leading us to have these mental wellness problems. So this was figure one in that paper that I that I just mentioned. This is figure two in that paper. And what I what I did on the next two slides is I've cut this graphic in half and blown it up so that you can see it a little better. I was afraid that this might be too small to show to everybody. Um, and so this graphic, the top part of it is here. Here's glyphosate, changing what happens in the crops, changing what's happening in the microbiome. And that's leading to problems, not just at the level of the bacteria, the actual microbiome, but it's also leading to changes in intestinal integrity, what we would call leaky gut, which has a whole host of other problems. If you have leaky gut, you very often have autoimmune system problems. So, you know, there's also an explosion in autoimmune system problems. There's an explosion in food allergies, food intolerances, people being, you know, intolerant to gluten or intolerant to dairy or th th things like that. And that's not necessarily the bacteria, the microbiome, it's actually the integrity of the tissue of the gut itself. So you're changing the bacteria, you're changing the tissue of the gut, and you're changing the metabolic profile of the whole system. You're basically damaging this, this internal on-demand pharmacy. So now it's, it's still internal, but it's not very effective at producing what you need when you need it. And that leads to a whole, whole host of problems, which you can see on the bottom of this graph. And it's everything from these mental wellness problems, hormone disruptions, cardiovascular problems, digestive system problems, reproductive problems, and then overall immune system and, and, and sort of like longevity, anti-aging kinds of problems. Um, so it's, it's very widespread. Um, one of the things in the kind of work that I do, and I'm going to show you one of the studies that we've done, um, the kind of work that I do, people will sometimes look at the benefits that we get with a microbiome intervention, and they'll say, how in the world could one intervention, repairing the microbiome, how could it generate so many benefits, physical benefits like athletic performance, um, lower inflammation, lower oxidation, better mood state, um, superior immune system protection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it all comes back to this idea of if your microbiome is out of balance, you're going to have problems in all of these areas that you see on the screen right now. If your microbiome gets put back into balance, you're going to see benefits in all of these areas, right? So it's, you know, I don't want it to make it sound like, you know, the microbiome is the new silver bullet, 
Um, and then if you just fix your microbiome, everything's going to be glorious. But this is really where the new research is, that if we can get the right microbiome and and here, you know, going back, going back specifically to the glyphosate question, um, look at look at what these these aromatic amino acids do. They do a heck of a lot throughout the entire body, not just the neurotransmitter piece, but their cofactors for vitamins, their neuroprotectants, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's doing, it's doing a heck of a lot. So here's one of the studies that we did. We used a, 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 an extract from, uh, from, a, from a fruit called palm fruit. Um, this was a work that we did with some, with some colleagues at MIT. Um, this is a water soluble extract from the palm fruit that yields these these very unique polyphenols. And if you think back a few minutes ago when, when I talked about the shikimate pathway and when Dr. Senef talked about the shikimate pathway, this is the pathway that, that, that glyphosate interferes with to reduce the production of those, of those um, aromatic amino acids, which are the building blocks for your neurotransmitters. By delivering these nutritionally, right? We have people supplement with them you're doing sort of an end run around that part of the pathway. So even if it's blocked, even if that pathway is inhibited, you have these building blocks to for your body and your, your microbiome specifically to use these as building blocks to make more dopamine so you're motivated, make more serotonin so you're happier. You, you, guys, you guys get the idea. So what we did in this trial was we supplemented people with it, um, several trials. Some of the trials looked at heart health, some of the trials looked at brain health. Some of the trials looked at healthy aging, where we were measuring oxidation and inflammation. We saw benefits in all of those. When we look specifically at gut health, we're seeing this, that this palm fruit extract changes what's happening at the level of the gut, and it does things like this, increases the production of short-chain fatty acids, which is important for immune system and inflammatory balance increases levels of a particular kind of bacteria called acromancia, which is having more of that is related to having better gut integrity and better metabolism. And elevated levels of this other uh, specialized bacteria, Fecal bacterium prusnitzii, which is typically low in a lot of the metabolic problems that you see, Crohn's disease, obesity, asthma, things like that. So, um, supplementing with something like these these shikimic acid derivatives that we see in palm fruit is a way that we can rebuild that damage that is caused by something like glyphosate. We've also shown similar studies for nutrients like astaxanthin. Astaxanthin is a is a carotenoid that comes from algae. So this is the reason that that salmon is pink because the salmon eats the algae and that astaxanthin gets into their flesh. And we've known for a long time, it's an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, but here we've been able to show that it helps the signaling across the gut-brain axis and helps to improve physical performance and also mental performance. So we also did a study that we presented at the American College of Sports Medicine meeting a couple of years ago, where we looked at supplementing palm fruit and astaxanthin um, to improve physical and mental health. And so I'm just going to I'm just going to go right to the results part, uh, portion of this. We're able to show that it improves it improves what happens at the microbiome, but then because of that, it improves cardiovascular efficiency. So now your heart is working better. That we can measure by something called heart rate variability. So if your gut is working better and your heart is working better, your brain is also working better. And that's what we measured with this profile of mood states. We were able to show significant reductions in all of these negative mood states. So depression is cut by, by 76%. Fatigue is cut by 51%. Mental confusion is cut by 62%. The flip side of that is that your focus is better by 62%. So a lot of benefits because of what we're able to do at the level of the microbiome. So I'm going to skip over this one. I'm going to skip over that one. So the, the so the you know the end result of this is that there are things that we can do to fight back against 
the damage that we're seeing with these chemicals contaminating our food, contaminating the environment, are b- being exposed to. Ideally, we would want to remove that contamination, right? We would want to lower our exposure to that damaging compound. But when we can't, and I think we need to be a little bit practical here, when we can't, there are things that we can do to get ourselves in a better place physically and mentally if we think about sort of root cause. You know, glyphosate is causing a problem here. That's leading to a problem there. Are there ways that we can circumvent those those problematic aspects of metabolism? Um, Another way that we can do it is by changing what we're eating. So in the U.S. right now, and this really goes for U.S., Europe, Asia, any industrialized country are really eating kind of an American pattern of diet, right? A Western diet where we're eating too many processed foods. So if our processed foods are 60% or 70% of our overall caloric intake, if you can just eat less of that and shift your eating pattern away from processed foods towards more whole foods, whether that means you're growing your own foods, you're raising your own foods, you're buying foods in a, in a, in a, um, in a like a you know you're cognizant of where your food comes from and how it's being grown and choosing organic and things like that that can go a long way probably the the the, the dietary pattern that has the most data for how it supports the microbiome and therefore how it supports heart health and immune system health and metabolic health and mental health is the mediterranean diet and it's a, it's an eating pattern that looks like this i've taken in my most recent book that Patricia held up, this one right here, mental fitness, I have a mental wellness diet where I've taken the best aspects of the Mediterranean diet and the Okinawan diet and the Scandinavian diet and the et cetera, and said, what are the, what are the commonalities of all these diets in these blue zones around the world that are helping people live longer and, and, and have more health span and, and, and um, you know, live, live longer, healthier? Uh, and I've and I've put that together in a in a plan that looks like this. But one way that I will I'll, I'll I'll leave you with this something that we can all do is this thirty plant challenge. This is one of the best ways, and I challenge all of my students to do this. Try to do this: eat thirty different plants within a seven day period. And so you can choose from vegetables and fruits and seeds and nuts and spices. Why thirty? We know that thirty is kind of the sweet spot. Uh, from the from the um from the uh from the um from the microbiome project we know that eating 30 is better than 25 and eating 25 is better than 20 but eating 35 isn't that much better than 30 so 30 will improve your microbiome diversity and that's why it's the target so if you eat 30 different plants vegetables fruits seeds nuts spices in a 7 day period you will increase your microbiome diversity. And among microbiome researchers like me, there's only one thing we all really agree on, right? Because it's such a new area of research. We agree on diversity is a good thing. More diversity is better. And eating more plant foods is the way to do that. So if you can choose that, you're gonna do a lot to repair your microbiome that has maybe been damaged by some of the things that we've talked about today. So last one, I'll leave you with this. If you want to learn more about, you know, any of this, you know, any of the diets, any of the books, any of the lifestyle interventions, even any of the supplements, you can contact me at any of these uh, social media channels. Um, and then Patricia's link right here um, will will give you information about any of the supplements, you know, the specific probiotic strains and the specific fibers and the specific palm fruit extracts and things like that uh, that you might want to add into your into your daily regimen. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Vicky and Patricia and see if we have some questions. Thanks a lot, you guys. Well, thank you so much. Let's see if I can, can't turn my camera back on. But, um, phenomenal, just phenomenal. So glad we recorded this. I think everybody's going to have to listen to that a few times. Uh, Vicky, do you want to start the, the q and I've got questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull back and, and let everybody else Go ahead. That was great. I was, I really, really enjoyed that. Sean, thank you very much. Um, I work, I'm a nutritional therapist and I work with menopausal women and that is just like tying so much of what I do together. Um, Gosh, we've still got people joining, just bear with. Right. 
questions people questions let's have your questions for everybody in fact let's have sean um stephanie and john if you like to turn your cameras on it would be really great for people to see you um i'm sure we must have some questions going on we've got some great hands um do you want to type your question uh, in excuse me? me it says i'm unable to um oh hang on oh, just let me find me, uh, you locked <laughs> um let's there we go how's that uh, no, thank, you. thank you is it the same for you as well hang on. oh no you uh hang on you've all moved it's bear right. with me let me find john you've there you go there you are there we go there we go and yeah hans gunther has a question hans do you want to unmute and ask your question are you able to do that let me see i think that's the best way thank you very much and uh my question is just after listening to uh, Dr. Well, he's not a doctor, sorry, Breck, um, David Brecker, 10X Health. And he points out that the methylation pathway in human beings of digesting folates is inhibited. And now hearing you talk about the methylation problem through glyphosate, I'm wondering if either you, uh, Stephanie, or you, Sean, could elucidate some on that if you have any reference to that. Now, I could certainly speak to the methylation pathways. I think glyphosate is severely disrupting them. And actually, it's even worse than that because formaldehyde plays a critical role. The gut microbes make a lot of formaldehyde, and then they know how to turn it into formate using an enzyme called formaldehyde dehydrogenase. Glyphosate suppresses that enzyme. It's been shown in studies on E. coli. This causes formaldehyde toxicity, which leads to cancer such as colon cancer. And it also interferes with the methylation pathways because that formaldehyde is actually being fed into this, um, the whole methylation system um, by, by forming methyl tetrahydrofolate from formaldehyde. And then that eventually becomes methionine, which is the universal methyl donor. So that whole system, methionine is also suppressed by glyphosate. It's been shown in studies, many studies show that uh, both the aromatic amino acids are suppressed and also methionine. And so methionine is a universal methyl donor. So both because of the formaldehyde problem. And in fact, it's really interesting because there's an enzyme in E. coli that's highly overexpressed, which actually involves co combining formaldehyde with glutathione uh, and then using that as a way to get to formate. So there's like a workaround from the formaldehyde dehydrogenase deficiency that causes E. coli to use up glutathione in the process of trying to detoxify the formaldehyde. So you get also glutathione deficiency, methylation pathway deficiency, um, formaldehyde toxicity. All of those can come about from glyphosate in the gut. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just add. I talk about methylation pathways a lot because it's it, it's those pathways that are needed to produce neurotransmitters. You know, so you know a lot of times as a nutritionist, people are asking me about B vitamins. You know, should I supplement with this form of B vitamin or this one, and do they have to be methylated or not? And you know what I say is, if you're going to supplement with B vitamins, yes, they should be methylated. That's going to be better better able to be utilized in your body. But if you have a if you have a balanced microbiome, that microbiome should make all the methylation cofactors that you need to to so that you have healthy neurotransmitter production and again if your microbiome is damaged you're not going to be able to perform those methylation reactions and your, your neurotransmitter levels are not going to be where they need to be so you're going to feel you're going to feel kind of blah you know which is kind of the standard situation for a lot of people these days that they just they might not be clinically depressed or have generalized anxiety disorders but they just feel kind of tired and blah and maybe in the evening they're kind of wired because they can't calm down we can trace that all right back to these problems that we're seeing at the level of the microbiome thank you so much uh, so instead of uh, supplementing uh, to improve the methylation pathway i suppose like myself i have to stay away from uh, the influence of glyphosate and other poisons and toxins to have a healthy gut because i'm dealing with uh, for 20 years with arrhythmias that I accentuated when I'm exposed to glyphosate, eating food with other people, you know, being social. And um, yeah, let's grow more local food. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Organically. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Hans. Um, Diana Smith, would you like to ask your question? Unmute and ask your question. Okay. Um, yes, I, partly aimed at John, I think, on this one. Um, I can quite see the point that we would like to reduce the use of this or, or 
remove it entirely. Um, I would imagine that conversations with farmers probably go along the lines of, well, how on earth are we supposed to do that? You know, because we're depending on it. That's that's how our crops grow. Um, I think that John is probably wanting to do what I would like to do and focus on small producers uh, and much more hands on. How easy you are you finding it in practice to encourage people to take that route? <laughs> um <clears throat> thanks diana it takes a lot of patience um it's it i'm just at the start of 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 this kind of quest and i think that i'm going exactly for where you're going which is aiming at small farms um and really encouraging people to band together to create communities mm -hmm. and as i said in my presentation i mean we don't have to persuade farmers to make that transition straight away there are people around the world that are going to farmers asking to rent land from them mm. and showing them what can be done through the regenerative pathway so most farmers are so in debt that they can't take that chance mm. they're, they're completely reliant upon it um so i think it's a slow process that we have to make diana and it's going to take a lot of patience um there, there's a guy in um devon at the moment who's using regenerative practices he's made his own type of um natural fertilizer and he's going to farms in his local area and he's using that so he's saying can we use an acre we'll show yeah. you in a season the difference between what you're doing and what we're doing and i think those types of approaches are going to be the way to move forward um but yeah i think the the best thing i can encourage people to do is go to start using these regenerative practices in your garden at your allotment mm. and then slowly that will spread out further and further but it's, it's going and to then, take time so, exactly yeah. and then i mean we've come up against this diana at the pffa we were trying to talk to farmers and they're just really not that interested so now we're looking more at speaking to individuals and helping them to build local communities etc mm -hmm. and i think it's it's with events like this that if we educate people as to what is happening with glyphosate and how it's affecting mm -hmm. us and our health and the health of the soil and impacting the environment and our mental wellness if we can educate more people then and more people become aware they will start asking or looking for more food that doesn't have that impact on it that they can then make themselves feel better through eating um and that's why we're involved like i'm i work at my little farm which is a community farm um where we are all regenerative um and it's just creating that awareness so that more and more people ask and that so we kind of have to go in the back door and then the farmers will be like oh well i'm not actually producing the food that people want so yeah. that's another way but again like john says it takes patience because that's not a quick fix we but it's it's an in we have to just as insidious as glyphosate has been we have to kind of be as positively insidious in creating this awareness for everybody there's one particular thing which I think might help with this. Um, I think the SFI funding conditions have not been very clear in terms of um, fund funding for um, regenerative market gardening. And if that can be clarified, I did come across something that was issued just before the election by the previous government, which indicated that they thought that SFI should be targeted at that. Um, I, so I don't know whether that's going to be carried through with the new government or not, but it's worth pursuing it, perhaps. Mm. I think also as well, the problem, we have to be very careful because there are governments around the world and these kind of multinational companies are using regenerative yes. 
the regenerative term are actually not making it regenerative. Mm -hmm. So I think that the way I see the future playing out in regards to farms is these big farms aren't going to be able to survive unless they go to regenerative practices. Mm -hmm. So I think it's for the small farms to make that example. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're going to make much more of it. They're going to take the chance because they haven't got so much to lose. So get out there, find your local farmer, make friends with them, maybe work on the farm, put in some volunteering, you know, because any change has to come through trust. People aren't going to do it any other way. Thank you. You're welcome. So this is a great question that has been answered a bit in the comments, but I know that you will all have something to say. So why, Janet, this is from Janet Ellis. So why are the government allowing glyphosate to be used? <laughs> Who wants to start with that one? <laughs> I get, let, let me let me let me start with that one. I get asked this question all the time, you know, in <laughs> saying like, if like if this is really true, what you're talking about, glyphosate right. damaging the microbiome and all these problems that come from it, how in the world can it be, you know, still on the market? You know, and I and I I try to I try to take the 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 most um what's the word that I'm looking for the most generous uh, a view of the of the industry, which is well, uh, we didn't know anything about the microbiome. Uh, when when this chemical was introduced into the world, unleashed into the world, um, so maybe give them the benefit of the doubt, right? That okay, you know, we 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 knew the bacteria were there. We didn't really know anything of what they do. It's only in the last decade or so that we've really honed in on understanding what the microbiome does for the immune system and mental health and physical, et cetera, et cetera. So it's only been about a decade that we've known this. So it takes time. And you, you, you know, you guys were just kind of talking about this, right? To educate people and keep educating and keep putting the word out there and, you know, be sticklers for it and things like that. And things will hopefully change. But then there's the other side of it, which is, and some of this is in the comments, it's money and it's special interests. And there's all kinds of things that are, I mean, pretty significant headwinds to even if something we know something now that we didn't know before, changing the status quo is always is always difficult. So anyway. And I will add, of course, that the regulators are being bought by the industry and the industry <laughs> actually, well, there were, there were all these uh, lawsuits, you know, for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma which I thought could take glyphosate down altogether in, with time because they were just, there's like hundreds, there's thousands of, hundreds of thousands, I think, over a hundred thousand lawsuits active right now pending. And there were some spectacular wins with jury trial, uh, three of them within the course of a year, I think, that um, really set the stage for others to sue Monsanto for glyphosate. And that has been a, a huge pressure point for them. And they actually decided to take glyphosate out of the Roundup formulation that they sell to the public in uh, not the not for the food but for the for the dandelions in the yard you know the, the re residential use they no longer uh, put as far as I understand they stopped putting uh, glyphosate into Roundup at the beginning of this year um, but now they're so they're fighting back uh, legally that the industry has got a clever plan now and Bayer has been pressuring at the state level pressuring the states to pass laws and those laws would look like the vaccine laws, basically. Glyphosate is so essential for food production that we can't afford to be without it. So if people start suing Monsanto, well, actually Bayer, uh, because of their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, if too many people do that, Bayer will, will fold or you know, glyphosate, will, they will no longer produce glyphosate because there's too much, much risk from lawsuits. We can't afford that to happen. And therefore, we're going to pass a law that says the industry can't be sued. Even if you've gotten on Hodgkin's lymphoma at the age of 30 and glyphosate, it's the only thing you were exposed to. Too bad for you. You can't sue. This is what they're working on. And they've got a couple of bills going on in some of the states. I think it's Iowa and Missouri. I'm watching that closely and I'm very uh, worried about that process because they could end up really solving their problem if they can get, and they do it with the vaccines. One state, one state and then another state starts approving that vaccine. And then eventually all the states approve it. So they, they, there's kind of a, the rest of them follow like sheep. So once you've got the example set, uh, they're hoping, and then it'll become a federal law. And then glyphosate will be free to just, Monsanto can poison all they like and nobody can stop them. Patricia, I think that, sorry. 
sorry, go on. No, no, you go, go for, for it, John. It. No, I was just saying, I mean, <clears throat> I've done a lot of research over the past 15 years on um, the corruptness of um, governments, et cetera, et cetera. Glyphosate is just one of these things where if they make people sick, the big farmers <laughs> can pretend to make people well. We're in a we're in a place, you know. I mean, I think on a deeper level, spiritually, these people are so divorced from nature and what it is to be human. You know, this is transhumanism, isn't it? Is actually trying to make human beings not natural. So whatever chemicals they can pump into us, they will. And this isn't all doom and gloom. This is part of our evolution as a, as a human race. I think glyphosate is just <laughs> glyphosate is just a um, a manifestation of a sick society, and actually we've been divorced from nature and our natural connection to the earth for a long time. So this is why things like glyphosate have been able to slip into our food system. So that's all quite negative. I just want to say that actually this is this is a time for us to actually stand up together and approach it from your level um stephanie from sean's perspective from the food growing and actually why not you know we can stand up and fight this is a revolution and i'm really excited what's going to happen in the next few years Thank you for that. And I agree with you. I feel very excited Thank about you. this small group of people who are doing everything they can to change the system. And really, uh, mm -hmm. instead of trying to fix the problem, you just basically introduce a solution. I think that's an awesome way to do it. Show them how exactly. to do it right which is what you're doing. And that is just so fantastic. It brings chills up my spine. So thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think it does all come down to that. It's all, uh, it's all about education and like you say, John, it's we have to get back in touch with nature and it's almost it's forcing us to we need to get away from the synthetic and we just need to reconnect and rediscover who it is that we are as humans and how we can emphasize that and, re you know, reconnect with all of that. So, yeah, I think it's it's actually a positive because yeah. it's forcing us to do it. Um. Yeah, so Patricia, that's what I was going to get you. Say what you put in the comments about it was going to be banned in Europe. Yeah, there, there was some talk a few years ago. We were all waiting for that deadline to come when glyphosate would be banned. And uh, nothing was talked about. Oh, somebody wants to buy one of Sean's T-shirts. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, so glyphosate was due to be banned in Europe December last year. And you, you'd have to be like a, a skulker like me to know what was going on. So uh, Bayer, their CEO has been posting for some time that because of the billions and billions paid out in these lawsuits that, that Stephanie mentioned are on the brink of bankruptcy, but because they own everything, they went to the European member states that carried the most votes. It's not one country, one vote. I think Italy, Germany, and France carry more votes than, than some of the others. Bought them off. Just bought them off. Bought the votes. They allowed it for another 10 years. And nobody knows that. Nobody knew it was happening so they could do anything about it. Pesticide Action Network is brilliant. They were fighting um, really, really hard. Really, really hard. But money, there's so much money. When you're talking billions and trillions of dollars and pounds, it's really hard to um, to fight against that. Um, I don't know if any of you will know the answer to this. Petra asks, um, has anyone in the UK asked for freedom of information requests on glyphosate and health and safety assessments? I imagine someone probably has, but what the answer to that, um, well, do you, I don't who know. Who do you ask? I'll just say real quickly, uh, Therese Coffey, who's not in office now, but she's the environmental minister what the, the last uh, government and she posted glyphosate is absolutely fine it's here to stay in britain i think that was maybe in the, the guardian i have copies of 
photocopies of that. Um, so uh, people like that are saying dumb stuff like that. You know, she's bought as well. Yeah. Um, what did I see? Connie says that she understands that the U.S. Farm Bill now being worked on in Congress includes a section that prevents individuals from suing Monsanto and Bayer. So that ties up with what Stephanie was saying. Um, yeah, and Hans says, um, and I know this obviously applies to you, Patricia, in Honiton. In Forest Row, Sussex, we now use, uh, we use opt out with the council to not have Roundup sprayed in streets. And that's what you have as well, isn't it, Patricia? I think there are quite a few councils doing that, but then they find ways around it. And what well, were you telling us before we started, Patricia? So I, I moved to Honiton uh, three and a half years ago, and I soon learned after I moved here that they just banned glyphosate. I was so excited. I rang the council, spoke to the guy who was responsible for putting it through. I asked him, how many years did it take? How many petitions did you have to circulate? What sort of pushback did you get? He said, Oh, I just went to the council and said, yeah, sounds like a good idea. Then he was gone. The next guy that came up, we had a great conversation. They were getting um, hot uh, foam sprayers to use. And he was going to invite me to the inaugural, inaugural demonstration. Never got the phone call, left messages, no answer. Uh, two weeks ago, I wanted to ring up and let them know about the summit. Someone new was in 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 the hot seat and uh, left my number for her to ring me back. Never got the call. And then last <clears throat> last Wednesday, a uh, one of the environmental officers rang me back, and we had a great conversation about an hour and a half. Those hot foam sprayers never got used. The people who were tasked uh, for for uh, their job was to spray the glyphosate. Now they're supposed to use these hot foam sprayers to keep the weeds and, and the grass down, are refusing to use them. Oh, gosh. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have never had a job where I continue to get paid for not doing what I was paid to do. <laughs> Unless Which, your boss didn't you want you to do it. <laughs> well, you never know. So, so they're letting the grass and the weeds grow so they'll reverse the ban. Mm. And when I go out foraging, I, I've noticed I can't get to the elderberries now because the, the brambles are so overgrown. I wonder what's going <laughs> on. So now I know what's going on. So I, I was asked to write an article on glyphosate for uh, Healthy New Healthy Life Essex. So now that that's published, I'm going to send that out to other magazines and just see what we can do to just keep getting this in front of people they'll see it here they'll see it there they'll see it somewhere else and then it'll be so familiar maybe something will will sink in and uh so this guy i spoke to last week said you know i said i'll do do live meetings videos we just need to let people know how bad it is and if, if i mean a poster with like snow white's apple letting them mm -hmm. know that apple you're giving your children has no fewer than 15 different pesticides on it. You really want to give it to them? Brilliant. Yeah. So Sean, you're going to have to give us details of how we buy your shirt, your t-shirts, because people are asking. So we're going to need to include that. And someone loves, loves your love print behind you. Um, so also there's a few comments from people um, Diana and Rachel and that about community projects that you guys are working on if um, and that you're finding to be challenging please do get in contact with us at the PFFA um, because we may be able to help we can certainly get you in touch with your local mm -hmm. ambassadors um, etc and that could be beneficial for you um Sorry, I'm just trying to work through. There's some really great comments here. Oh, people cha exchanging emails. Fantastic. Um, yeah, we should save the chat. I will. It, I think it will anyway. Um, oh, John, question for you. Do you incorporate any electroculture? A slightly uh, off topic, but... Yeah, that's all right. Um, the questions come up loads of times. I haven't. Uh, I know people that have, and they've had mixed results. 
my only concern with electro culture is if you're using copper um as the energy source you could potentially cause a toxicity of copper in the soil that would be my concern um but but give it a go you know i'd love to hear more results on how it goes There was a question. I've lost it. it. The whole chat moved. Oh, um, bear with me, everybody. Oh, here we go. How do you dispose of glyphosate safely, especially if bought in bulk? Ooh, okay. <laughs> I'm assuming you mean before it's been sprayed. So while it's still in its containers, well, it's perfectly safe. So what are you worried about? Um, <laughs> Would you take it back? Yeah, I wonder if you could. That would make a statement, wouldn't it? Yeah, for sure. And just leave it. But I mean, then we don't know what they're going to do with it. Um, oh, hang. Oh, was that you, Patricia? Yeah. There are local agencies who safely dispose of glyphosate. Towns who have banned it would be a good place to start. Yeah. So that might that might work. Right. I think. Oh, no. Hang on. More's coming in. Oh, sorry. There's one more question, yeah. which I saw above, which is. Yeah, do you mind? You've got to raise your speak. Uh, can you turn your mics off, please? Um, there, I've done it. Um, sorry, which question was it? Because I've got the so the one above. One... How do you dispose of glyphosate yeah. safely? Oh, okay. Hang on. Let me. Go um, back is it question. true that when you use yeah, Roundup on weeds, yeah, uh, if you leave the soil free of chemicals for six years, did we? No. No, we didn't ask that one. So is it true no. when you use Roundup on weeds, if you leave the soil free from chemicals for six years, it dispels from the soil? Well, no, it doesn't. Um, no, no. I mean, you, you've got to imagine the soil as a living ecosystem and it constantly cycles. So that that glyphosate could even be, it might come out of the soil, but it's going to go into the waterways. So if you've got soil that's been exposed to glyphosate, you need to remediate it as soon as you possibly can. There was a study in uh, Canada that uh, where glyphosate had been, had been applied to trees uh, 12, 10, 12 years before, and then they found glyphosate in the tissue of the trees 12 years later. Yeah. Any more questions? There's some great questions there. Um, I think we've answered them all. Not um, yet. Sorry, someone keeps... Okay. No more questions? Any last words from any of our speakers? Uh, oh, hang on. I do... Oh, is that... Are you wanting to ask that one, Patricia? Yes, please. Go. So. I have a comment. Yeah, we're just having a question at the minute. Patricia's going to okay. ask a question. Okay. Do you want me to ask it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Go on. I've always wanted to know. So you and and Stephanie both mentioned the shikimate pathway. So we we some of us know that our bodies are sort of ten to one uh, bacteria to human ratio. So the bacteria that have the shikimate pathway. Are they, is it only the good bacteria? Is it all bacteria? And then is it is it only the bacteria in our gut? Is there the bacteria all over our bodies? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really good question. Um, I think I think the true answer is we don't really know. You know, we know that in general, the microbiome is a producer of these neurotransmitters. But there, you know, when we talk about the microbiome, it's a hundred trillion bacteria you know, some several thousand species of bacteria, uh, and not all of them are neurotransmitter producers, right? So I'm actually not sure um, if they all have the pathway and it's active in some and not active in others or or what. So I think, I think that's, we do know that there are certain strains like, you know, specific genetically, not genetically modified, but genetically specific strains that are good producers of serotonin or good producers of GABA, right? So we know that that is, that is true, but I think, um, I don't know if we can divide it so, so like broadly into like, you know, the good guys and the bad guys, so. I, I can say something on that. Uh, 
there was a study that showed 54% of the microbes in the gut have that pathway. So that's sort of about half of the microbes have the pathway. And the other thing is how sensitive is their particular version of that enzyme to glyphosate. Some have a, a resistant version of the enzyme, just like what's used in the GMO, GMO crops. But the, the studies have shown that bifidobacteria and lactobacillus are especially sensitive to glyphosate. So they're getting killed off preferentially, and those are beneficial bacteria. Right. There you go, Sean, for something else to formulate. Uh, I do, this is my favorite question to always end on, not that we have to stop now, but uh, Stephanie, is it possible to limit our exposure to glyphosate on our fruits and veggies by washing in vinegar, baking soda, mm -hmm. or peeling or cooking? No, not glyphosate. Glyphosate goes into the tissues and you can't wash it off. That's kind of a bit of a mic drop moment, as they say, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'm hearing so many, you know, I've said this to you, we've had this conversation, Vicky, so many nutritional experts are telling people to Just wash it with vinegar. vinegar. <laughs> yeah, I think it's that like helps it. to get rid of the um, insecticides, but not glyphosate. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I just, there was, oh, the questions keep moving around. Uh, yes, there, so just to reiterate for everybody asking, there is a recording. It will be sent out. We'll, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and then it will be sent out. You will get um, information on each of our wonderful speakers, links to their books and how to contact them, etc. cetera. Um, so don't worry about that if you missed it. And if you didn't miss it, but you want to listen to some of it again, which I know I certainly will be. Um, so I, I think... have a comment. I have a comment. Yes, yeah, sorry. Carry on. You know, this is my this is my Campbell. I did over two hundred uh, performance horse stress management clinics, uh, stressed uh, stretched over a couple of years, you know, all west of the Mississippi, all in, mostly in front of horse groups and in a few veterinarian cl clinics. But uh, what I wanted to say about the veterinarians, uh, they aren't any more uh, astute or aware of glyphosate than doctors, really. But uh, when I, I've said I've asked several veterinarians uh, just a question just to see what their reaction would be is I said to them over 50 percent of the uh, illnesses that come through your door uh, or any issue that comes through your door well over 50 percent of them have some connection to glyphosate and I just do that to see what their reaction is and you know something they just roll their eyes they just they, they just don't want to face it they don't want to talk about it it's a, it's the weirdest thing so i just wanted to make that comment thank you michael yeah very very interesting um well, and then, sorry yeah just and then we have, yeah one more question uh are white you have your hand up would you like to unmute and ask your question Good evening, everyone. Yes, uh, I did try to put it in the chat. What it was, um, on my father's land in Jamaica, uh, a one of the relatives had spray, sprayed Gramosol. Gra is it called Gramosol? What England and America had banned because of the cancer, um, what it caused. Now, this was about, say, 16 years ago. So are you saying that that soil is no good to use again in this present day, that three acres? Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, all pesticides can be remediated. Um, it takes time. I mean, I think the best thing to do would be to test the soil to see if it's still there. So when I go back, test and, the soil and just see yeah. if it's still... Because so, I know so a lot you can of people send it off to a lab. Sorry. Say that again, sorry. I noticed a lot of people started dying in the area of cancer when mm. they were spraying that stuff. After five yeah. years, we had a spate of people dying, and I was telling them not to use it because it was banned in England and America. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I, I would say if you go, you, there are labs, toxicity labs, which will be able to identify whether that's still in the soil. Yes. Um, once you once you, once you identify you that? that, you, you can you, you happy feel free to contact me. And then I can kind of, we can discuss about what can be done about it. Okay, thank you very much. No worries. Brilliant. So I think, I think that is it. I can't see any more 
questions coming up. Well, I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers, such amazing knowledge. And we've had so many positive comments on, um, you know, thanking for the information that's been shared tonight. So I hope that you've all enjoyed these presentations and that with that knowledge being shared, you've gained a deeper in understanding of the critical impact that glyphosate can have on our soil, our gut health, our ecosystem, and just how insidious it is. But it isn't all negative because there are things that we can do about it. And it all starts with us. Every one of us needs to continue to share the knowledge that we have. And that applies to you guys as well, that now you can tell people, you can learn more, you can, you can spread the word too. And more to the point, we can start looking for those farmers, for those growers who are growing without these kind of pesticides and to start growing our own. John and myself can help you with that, should you be interested. Um, but just we we are the mycelium network that can now move this through to everybody and to um to resolve it because it is resolvable so thank you very much thank you speakers you've been absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. it's been such a good evening um, i thoroughly enjoyed it so thank you very much everyone and thank you for organizing this. I was very happy. Thanks, to be everyone. To Good. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You. Stephanie. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sean. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. And we will yes, see you all I again soon, boost. I'm sure. So thanks ever so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. Good night. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.